Welcome back. There is a 76 billion uh, infrastructure bond that has been released by the CBK. It's in the market. You can take advantage of it while, of course, we are causing about uh, continued borrowed by the government. Uh, several segments of the investment community in the country are taking advantage of the infrastructure bond and the many other bonds that are available in the market. Um, perhaps we will continue with the conversation. Churchill is joining us for this conversation. Churchill, welcome back. Thank you. Excellent. You had mentioned something about risk price uh, mo modeling or, or risk-based modeling. Uh, could you just explain what that is? Uh, well, uh, this I may take you back to when you had the interest rate caps. Uh, that was between August 2016 all the way to November 20, 2019, at least that's when the last uh, last leg of that cap was removed. So what happened, I mean, it was just uh, a way of restricting credit within uh, capping credit to some certain limits. But having removed, uh, so all people thought that now banks will go back to where they were lending at 20% at and thereabouts. But more or less, uh, from a moral situation level, CBK more or less capped it in the sense that I think during that time when the rate cap were removed, uh, one of the players came out and uh, I think he was um, more or less uh, thrown under the bus uh, by the CBK to the extent that they need to not get their rates back to where they were pre the interest rate cap. So what uh, CBK and coming from the fact that they had this uh, banking sector charter where there are four key pillars, so CBK came and proposed to the banks that they need to come up with their risk price models, which more or less ensures that uh, credit is priced properly. We don't have the, those kind of predatory lendings. So that's where we are. I don't think we've seen uh, much in terms of progress that these uh, pricing models have been approved by the apex banks. So where we are from a banking sector, there's not that credit mediation uh, in terms of lending activities uh, being propped up in as much as uh, we are beyond post the interest rate caps model. So that's the last uh, layer that is remaining hurdle if I may say that is remaining so that we can see that increased uh, credit mediation activities in the banking sector. Yeah. Kenya is expected to issue two euro bonds by June of this year. In other words, infrastructure bond is not the only bond we are looking at. Uh, there are two euro bonds coming along. Um, first of all, perhaps you might want to explain to some of my viewers who are not privy to what a euro bond is, uh, what a euro bond actually is. And then after that, perhaps explain why would the CBK opt for a euro bond? And I, uh, one more euro bond or two more euro bonds this year. Uh, thanks for that. And just to bring out my views, this is just my views as Mr. Tachi Logoto, is that I see that they could just be one uh, euro bond, not even two, but that's just my view. But anyway, what's a euro bond uh, to your question? Uh, this is a bond uh, that is uh, floated not in Kenya or the Nairobi Stock Exchange, Securities Exchange, but it is floated in a different exchange. Uh, in this case, the euro bonds that have been issued, either they've been floated in the London Stock Exchange or the Island Stock Exchange. So those are bonds uh, issued by the government, but not floated locally. Okay. In, in a different ex in, in a in a different jurisdiction, mainly in Europe. Uh, the bonds are denom not denominated in the Kenya shillings. The Euro infrastructure bond that is being, is being floated, that is a Kenya shillings bond, but whereas the Euro bond denominated in hard currencies, dollar, euro, uh, British pound, any other hard currency. So that basically is uh, the uh, what we are seeing in terms of Eurobond. So getting into why is CBK uh, doing this? It's not even CBK uh, that is recommending a Eurobond. Uh, if it's for Eurobond, this is now a treasury. And now I'll take you back to the budget. Uh, we have what's called the budget policy statements which more or less gives its uh, intention in terms of expenditure, in terms of uh, revenue and also in terms of financing. So if you get into the financing bit, it also gives it what it wants to 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 get in 
into uh, from local financing or external financing and there's usually a split by the time we reach into euro bonds that the government is going to take euro bonds obviously it has exhausted the other multilateral financing by multilateral financing they need to uh, have discussions with the multilateral lenders before they can even come up with a, with a program or a facility by bilateral lenders they have to have discussions similarly before they come to that and then if any shortfall comes in that is not plugged domestically, they now go to raise money from international markets. So that's where the Eurobond comes in. And basically it, it, it comes from uh, the budget policy, uh, step, from the budget uh, to, to, to plug in uh, the budget uh, deficit. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> um, but you see, the debt regime in the country is bound to affect service delivery, it is bound to affect the currency, it is bound to affect the stock market. Can you perhaps just do an overview? I know perhaps we cannot explore or exhaust all uh, its effects, but can you just do an overview of the effect of this high uh, debt stock uh, regime uh, on the, the service delivery by government, on, on the currency and the stock market even? Uh, thanks. Uh, let me start with the service delivery. And if you look at uh, where we are uh, with the uh, high elevated public debt, uh, public debt stock, it also translates to the servicing of that public debt, be it interest payment and also the debt maturities. And uh, looking at the numbers we have, uh, the current uh, debt servicing, both interest payments and also the debt maturities, as a percentage to revenue, that is around 67%. So for every 100 shillings that is collected as ordinary revenue, seven shillings is either going to retire the debt that is maturing or to pay off uh, interest payments. So that's a big concern, which means that uh, this revenue that is collected, that is now meant to ensure that there is increased service delivery, is now, uh, now diverted at least to pay uh, this uh, debt. And debt is... Um, it's a fast charge in the budget. We have to pay our debt before even we think of other things. So it means that even the service service delivery is is more or less affected uh, because we don't have that. We don't. The government doesn't have that extra wiggle room at least to ensure that there's enough uh, resources to finance uh, to to ensure that the service delivery. Uh, and that uh, means that uh, hospitals will not have drugs. Uh, that means that, you know, the judiciary will be affected at some point like it was last time. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that at the end of the day, it's uh, risky Ramogi and risky Churchill will uh, struggle out of it. Yes, absolutely. You have nailed, uh, you have nailed it. Uh, in, in your comments, yeah. And in terms of currency, because we now have, we, we need to service some of the external debts, uh, so it means that our reserves, it is subjected to those bouts of uh, volatility uh, whenever there is that uh, higher uh, external service requirements. Uh, so that just has a bent on our FX reserves and ultimately even the, even the currency uh, gets a hit from that. Okay. Do you see any impact on the stock market, uh, the securities exchange, uh, if there is or if there will be after this? Uh, from, a, from, from, a, from a broader perspective, I, you see that if the government is quite active on the uh, on on um, on uh, borrowing uh, and from I mean literature all over the world tells us that if this that elevated borrowing by the government is even more or less uh, the corporates the corporates in a way will more or less mirror what even the government is doing. So from a primary issuance perspective, and that's what you've even seen from an anecdotal perspective, when was the last IPO that you saw? It's been ages since you saw a really good proper IPO in the market. But basically what the big brother is doing, borrowing more or less is also mirrored in a small scale by other corporates who other than Borrowing from a bank or borrowing, uh, doing some corporate issues, which are even fund wide, 
they just borrow from the bank as opposed to even coming opening up their companies for increased corporates so from a primary uh, issuance you're seeing uh, more or less that being reflected uh, in the local market uh, with this increased borrowing in the corporates themselves are also mirroring that. And from a portfolio uh, perspective, I think that's quite neutral because um, more or less some of the foreigners are, are quite dominant in the bond segment, uh, not even the stock market. Uh, the bond segment, most of the infrastructure bonds, you see that most of them are participate uh, in a significant way on the infrastructure bond as opposed to the non-infrastructure bonds. So that we, we get to see some flows whenever the IFBs are issued. And if I may take you back, uh, if you see the currency from July to late last year, and even as we get into this year, we've seen that there's been some uh, increased weakness on the chain. So as a way of addressing that weakness, uh, government comes in and brings an IFB at least to attract those portfolio flows on the debt side. On the equity side stock market, I think more or less they look at the fundamentals. We're in a market whereby uh, we have Safaricom, 61% of the market capitalization. We have other banks, uh, banks sector, other 20%. So 80% of our market cap is held by uh, two sectors. That's the telco and the banking sector. So probably they may not even look at it from a debt perspective, but they're just looking at specifics of this uh, three or four companies that they are quite uh, heavy on. So it may not even affect them as such. You know, you've made me to think there are actually some very good companies that needs to come into the market through an IPO. And we've not seen that. I mean, companies like Mombasa Cement making good business down cost. Companies like Bidco Oil, uh, those guys have been making money for the longest time. Um, and, and you're not seeing them come to the market and, and, and uh, even Brookside Milk. Um, I would expect that they give us a piece of that uh, Brookside milk. Um, uh, Tiger Industries, sorry, I'm giving a list of guys who I'd want to buy from the market. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, I think the, the list is never uh, exhausted uh, if you think about all the names that should be listed, but they're not listed. Obviously, there are a number of factors around uh, listing, uh, perhaps some of these businesses. A number of these businesses are family-owned businesses. They may just want their uh, some reclusivity. They don't want, they feel that the moment they are out in the public, they just lose control or their, their they just feel that their control is more or less diluted. Uh, so there are a number of nuances around that issue, but uh, yes, to your point, uh, there are a number of, uh, from a listing perspective, there are a number of names that should be there. Uh, if you look at, in any given day, uh, there are just a few, out of the 58 or so listed stocks, there are just a few names that in any given day they trade or they drive the market. Others are quite uh, dead market. So if you can have some other high quality non-listed entities bring brought in the balls we can see some increased activity on even on the stock exchange on the equity side and also some of the some of these companies just bringing some corporate bond issue it could even drive up that market outside the government uh securities bonds uh, we also have a corporate bond segment but it's quite dead there's a listing that is coming up kenya mortgage refinancing corporation still hand in hand uh, with the this infrastructure bond Infrastructure bond, the government is seeking 75 billion. Kenya Mortgage Refinancing Company is seeking 1.4 billion. So, I mean, the odds, it's a no-brainer. Most of the investors might pivot towards uh, the government bond, infrastructure bond, as opposed to this KMRC. Yeah. Uh, so, that's those are the numbers that we're looking at. Uh, that makes sense. But come on, Bwana. Some of these families can just give us 30% of their shareholding and, and still still remain with 70%, and they'll still be making money. You know, at the end of the day, it ensures that there is quality of management as opposed to just making it a family affair, in which case, when the patriarch goes, uh, you have another situation of Naivas or Tusky supermarket. But Churchill, I don't want you to go in, back into that. I want us to finish this conversation, and I want to finish strong. Assuming you are then the advisor of one Raila Odinga or Musa, Musalia Mudavadi, I hope he's one of the horses, 
or uh, William Samoy Ruto, and you are advising them about the next government and what the next government should do to, one, manage the debt uh, uh, stock just so that there's sustainability to, and ensure that the economy picks up uh, almost immediately. What would you tell them? Yeah, obviously, uh, the debt sustainability, at least to ensure that... Uh, uh, that debt stock is more or less contained. If it's not contained, uh, and by contained we don't get into this uh, this um, um, cosmetic way, like moving from nine trillion absolute number and getting into some uh, percentage. Uh, this that propose proposal at least to ensure that uh, it's like fifty percent of uh, present value of public debt, which is quite complicated. So they just need to ensure that it's more or less sustainable in the sense that even the debt sustainability ratio, debt to revenue, debt to, ex to ex ex exports are quite on a positive trajectory. So I mean, it's just to look at it, uh, looking at how can we be able to drive, go up the value chain in terms of our exports. We are still sitting on the primary products. If we can just move up the chains in the, in, in the, in the terms of exports, at least we can be able to increase, reduce our trade uh, deficits, and with that, uh, we may not even need that recourse to having external people financing our debts on the financing account side. So that's one, and looking at even the current stock, and I think uh, right now the current public debt uh, management team have, uh, have are, are alive to that issue, is how to reduce the uh, the the debt uh, vulnerabilities. One way is now what they had proposed to change uh, the or uh, refinance the syndicated loans, which is around three three billion dollars, three hundred three hundred billion shillings thereabouts, and now have a lower rating. Because if you look at the external, uh, if you look at the syndicated loans, uh, we pay in any given year like eight cents upwards. Whereas we can even get at a concessional rate at below two percent. So yeah. if you can be able to reduce, uh, tweak, or change, uh, move away from uh, uh, those syndicated loans and into the concessional or semi-concessional, it will be able to reduce uh, the debt servicing costs. Uh, we haven't seen uh, syndicated loans uh, being bought in the last two years, so I think they're in the right course. But who knows when the next regime might now pivot back to syndicated loans? So that's also another thing uh, that they may be able to consider in terms of the overall debt sustainability. You said exports, and perhaps that touched a nerve with me. Uh, what are the easy wins as regards export? I have less than a minute, so just if you can just brush through. Uh, well, I think that uh, other than what we know, the traditional coffee and uh, and tea, which, by the way, are still exported in their primary form. What, how about, I mean, having those factories that they process them so that we export them in their finished good material. At least they have much more value add as opposed to when they are in raw form. So if they can be able to get into increasing the value add. I think two years ago there was a motion in parliament that was passed at least to ensure that there are some sectors that needs to be, I think it was fishing and uh, some of the other, I forget about the other sector. They had identified a number of sectors that they need now to ensure that there is more value add that is done. But as you and you and I know that some of these policy documents, some of these motions are passed, but then after that they just gather dust somewhere. So if some of these policies are implemented, we can now be able to at least increase our share of exports in value tax and uh, we can be able to at least have some sustainability in our debt uh, ratios. Thank you, Churchill. Um, that has been Churchill Ogutu, who is an analyst. I was talking to us about the debt situation in Kenya and the infrastructure bond that has just been released. Well, it has been an interesting conversation. You have learned what a Eurobond is. It's the kind of uh, bond that the government releases in a market 
different from its local market. Um, in, in our case, this has been mostly in the European markets, London and Ireland. Um, and they get the money to come and invest back into the country using into some of the government projects. The government is keen on doing two more euro bonds before this regime leaves office in August. At the same time, they have released um, 76 billion infrastructure bond that is going into the market. We were making sense of it. Of course, we mentioned things like crowding out effect, but at the same time, if you're an investor, go for it, make some money out of it. This has been Markets Today, and we have been talking about um, the economy and the macroeconomic environment, especially the public debt situation. We will leave you for now uh, with the currency trading of the day. It will be running in your screen in a few. Let's meet again on Monday at 4 p.m. as we talk securities. Goodbye.